welcome back. I am here today filming for the third or fourth time my miscarriage story. It's not that the other times were like too weepy or anything, although I think I've cried every time. It's mostly that I feel like I get tied up in the emotional stuff and then don't get all of the details out or I miss something. And then the first time was kind of too weepy, but that was a few weeks ago. So we're gonna run through my experience having a miscarriage, what that was like, what complications I encountered, what I wish I'd known then, so that if you are just finding out that you're going to go through it or if you are going through it yourself, maybe I can help. Um, if not, at the very least, let me commiserate with you um, I won't lie, it was a really, I don't know, I feel like this is one of those life experiences where you learn about a lot about who you are, as well as what you can handle. I used to think everything happened for a reason, and in some ways, I, I know that to be true, but there are some things that don't make any sense, and... I am not yet at the place where I can think like, oh, that happened so that this other thing could happen. Nah, it's just bullshit. This happened because life sometimes is just bullshit. So let's start from the beginning of this chapter. Last video, I, which I will try and put like the card up for, I haven't quite figured that out yet, um, was all about my experience being pregnant and I made it to, 10 weeks before I actually miscarried, but I found out that I was going to miscarry up at about nine weeks. Um, the baby, fetus, whatever you are comfortable calling it, never that we knew ever grew beyond about seven weeks. So anyway, let's get started. This is why I filmed it three times. Okay, so we go in for our nine week appointment on June 4th, where we are hoping to see an ultrasound with a heartbeat. We are hoping to see that the baby would have grown um, because when we went in last on May 22nd, the baby was seven weeks, five days, um, and it was measuring a little behind. Um, so we were hoping to see that baby would have caught up or at, at least have continued growing two weeks worth. Um, we went in for our appointment and at this point I'm almost out of my first trimester. So I feel like I'm almost out of the woods and I'm still so, so deep into the morning sickness. Um, I think the thing that ultimately ends up feeling the most like a betrayal is that my body continued acting like it was pregnant even after I found out that I was going to be miscarrying. Um, I was still feeling morning sickness until about two days before I miscarried, um, which just feels like bullshit. But um, yeah, we should do a drinking game of how many times I say bullshit in this video because I have a feeling I'm going to say it a lot. So I go in and I'm about to, I'm like one or two appointments away from graduating from my fertility specialist. So I've already made an appointment with my new OB. Um, they find it, they wanna know who that is. We talk about whether or not we're gonna get the genetic testing to find out any genetic markers that we need to know in fetus as well as if we're gonna find out the gender or the sex, as my husband always corrects me, we're finding out the sex of the baby. Um, and we had decided that we would. We start the ultrasound. I lay down. He puts, you know, the speculum, whatever, the ultrasound orby thing in. Um, and immediately, I mean, immediately, everyone in the room knew something was wrong. Because, first of all, my doctor, Dr. B, is normally a chatty Kathy. Well, I'm a chatty Kathy and he obliges me by continuing to chat so that I don't go insane with nerves and anxiety. Was silent. I was silent because what we saw on the screen was 
maybe half the size of what it had been two weeks prior, certainly not bigger. I didn't see a heartbeat. I actually didn't see, it. so last time we saw what looked like a peanut inside of a black blob. Um, and this time there was nothing inside the black blob, which I mean, that is a heart wrenching moment. Um, I knew things were really wrong because, uh, so my doctor is a man and I'm, I think it's a law, but they always have to have a, a woman as well or a second person in when they're doing ultrasounds or vaginal exams, I'm guessing. Um, but we always have either a nurse, practi nurse practitioner or someone else in the room with us. Um, so she grabs for tissues, which is when I officially let a little bit loose and start crying. Um, Ryan, thank everything, was at that appointment with me. Um, he's been at almost every appointment we've ever gone to with this fertility. Actually, I think everyone. Um, and I'm so grateful for that. I know that not everyone has the luck of being able to have that kind of flexible schedule to make that work. And I honestly can't actually fathom having that appointment by myself. So he was there with me. He grabs my hand. He is a very stoic person. So he's not crying, but I'm crying. Um, the doctor explains what I'm seeing, which is an empty, what it seems to be an empty gestational sac. Um, he doesn't actually say the word miscarry until the vaginal ultrasound thingy is out of me and I'm sitting up and he says, um, this is not good news, which I already knew. Um, I'll let you get dressed and uh, meet you in the office so they leave the room give us some privacy that's when I truly lose it um, it just felt like two weeks ago two weeks prior to this appointment we were scared because baby was measuring small but even though I knew this was a possibility and it's what I've been afraid of all this time I just didn't actually think it would happen. Um, and then another part of me, the really cynical part of me, we got pregnant. Our first medicated cycle with a timed intercourse, not even an IUI, with one follicle. And like, it was too good to be true. You know, when they say something's too good to be true, it's because it is. So... Yeah, so I cry and hold Ryan and pull myself together so we could go to the office. I sit down, we talk about how common this is. This is so common, so much more common than I ever knew. Almost every woman I've ever spoken to about this has either had an experience themselves or knows a family member or a friend who's also had this experience. I just think I think it is a shame how much women have felt like they can't talk about it because the thing that you feel when you find out that you're not going to have the baby that you thought you were going to have is you feel so broken and alone. Even with my very, very supportive husband sitting beside me even with the most supportive group of family and friends, I just felt like the most broken. Oh. So, we talk about why it happens. It could be a chromosomal, <laughs> I have been saying that word wrong every time I tell this story and I'm still not sure I'm saying it right, but I'm pretty sure it's a chromosom chromosomal <sighs> abnormality. And um, we talk about whether or not we're going to choose to do genetic testing on the remains or the con con uh, matters of conception, something 
something along those lines. Um, and we decided against it because it's our first and the doctor just wasn't confident that it would really tell us anything. Um, and I was really early on, so we just made the decision and moved on. Um, we discussed our what we would do, if anything, when we're ready to try again. And, you know, we did get pregnant on our first round with seven and a half milligrams of Femera and timed intercourse with a trigger shot. So he said he wouldn't do anything differently and that we're just gonna, you know, it just happens. And, and that is that. Um, he said something, which I, um, I think he thought I was going to take the wrong way or something, but I definitely did not. Um, he said that even though I had this eventuality, um, that I would be miscarrying my first, our first successful pregnancy or our first successful medicated cycle, um, that he was very optimistic about how everything went. My, I had never ovulated before this and we got me to ovulate and I, you know, that is the point of all this is to get pregnant. So he wanted me to know that even though I was going through this and even though this was going to be really hard, that he was still optimistic about my ability to get pregnant again the next time, um, which was helpful to hear. And um, we also talked about what my timeline would look like. So at this point, this was on a Tuesday, he thought that I had been taking progesterone, um, vaginal, not supplements, what's the other word? Suppositories. Um, all this time, so he told me to stop taking the progesterone. His actual guess was that if I hadn't been taking the progesterone, I probably already would have miscarried and that the progesterone was keeping me pregnant. Um, so I stopped taking progesterone immediately and he said that we should try and see if my body could pass it naturally first and then move on to a DNC if, if I don't. Um, so he said to give it the weekend and that then we would schedule the DNC for the following Friday. Um, I went along with this plan mostly because it was something that he, I mean, that was just the plan. Um, he did comment that there are complications that can arise from a DNC. Okay, we are back. Sorry, the camera fell. So we talked about some people struggling with um, excess tissue sometimes as a result of a DNC, um, scar tissue specifically, that could cause problems in the future, which terrified me. So I decided that instead we would go with his plan. I would try to see, you know, it would my body miscarry by itself between now and Monday and go from there. Got out of the doctor's office um, and got in the car and full on broke down. I, um, we called my mom. That was maybe the hardest phone call of my life. Um, we called the OB that we had a first appointment with the following day to cancel that. Um, and then we live luckily pretty close to some beautiful mountains. And so we went up to the mountains and I just sat for a little bit and took in some air and cried some more. Um, you know, the, uh, the injustice in infertility specifically is, I feel like it never gets better because when you are waiting to get pregnant, every moment feels like you're not getting what you want. And then when you get pregnant, the anxiety uh, and fear of miscarrying is there for me it was a gray cloud over every step of being pregnant and then when it happens that's awful and now we're gonna try again and 
I'm going to be 100% terrified the entire time. And if it works and I get pregnant a second time and I am so scared that I won't, but if I do, I'm going to be a mess of anxiety and, and fear that every step of the way, the bleeding that I had in the beginning at week five, the first time when the baby was measuring behind at week, what should have been week seven, but they measured at week six. I mean, those little things that I was told were nothing, maybe were something, maybe they were a sign and maybe something was wrong. Um, so I'm gonna be terrified if I don't get pregnant when we try again, then I'll be terrified that that was my chance and I'm ruined and I won't be able to do this again. <sighs> so yeah, basically now fear is just a part of my daily life. Um, so we survive the first day of finding out the news and I, the entire time I just felt like I needed to go home. So Colorado is my current home, but when shit hits the fan, I just, you, you just wanna be with your mom. And uh, luckily we had the opportunity to just fly home. So we flew to my parents' house and um, that was really hard because seeing the grief on their faces because they were also grieving something. My parents, this would have been the first grandchild and, and um, we were all excited, my whole family knew. Um, and so then my whole family was grieving this, which I don't think I'd really thought about when I decided that I wanna go, wanted to go home. Um, but it felt so good to get just hugged and loved on by my mom for a little bit when I was feeling so terrible. Um, and I didn't want to miscarry at home. I'm not sure what it was. I just did not want to associate that experience with my house. So I'm grateful that we went. The entire time that I was there, every second I was trying to figure out like, is it gonna start now? Did not. Um, I also, when I found out that I was going to miscarry, the doctors gave me a prescription for Vicodin or Oxycodone, whatever. And I didn't fill it that day. And the next day we flew away and I should have filled it that day. Ryan said we should fill it before we leave. And I should have listened to Rye. Rye, if you're watching this, you told me so. Because when we got to California, they won't fill my prescription because it's an out of state prescription for a narcotic and I could be a crazy person. I was crying at Walgreens in California, telling this lady, I just need meds in case I miscarry. No dice. Meanest pharmacist in California, pretty sure. Um, I mean, she was following the rules, doing her job, blah, blah, blah. Um, okay, so now I don't have the drugs involved and I am a uh, not great pill taker to begin with, but I knew that this was gonna be painful. I mean, I didn't know how much. But I didn't have them, so whatever happened was gonna happen. Uh, four days go by, still no miscarriage. Um, Sunday morning, we were still in California, and from about 1 a.m. to about 5 a.m., 1 a.m. to 3 a.m., for a few hours, I have intense bleeding and cramping. Um, so I think to myself, with my husband, that perhaps I have miscarried and I was very early on and maybe the miscarriage just doesn't take as long as the people say they do say it does because I you know was pretty early on I spend the whole day thinking that I miscarried I fly home thinking that I miscarried I go to my doctor's appointment Monday morning in in Colorado to find out no ma'am that was pre miscarriage bleeding that was in preparation. Um, go home, really upset because I think that I've gone through this. I think that the system, that this whole thing is over because the waiting to miscarry was fucking grueling. Only to find out that I did not miscarry because naturally my body won't do what it's supposed to do on a good day. 
It's certainly not going to do what it's supposed to do on a bad day. So I go home, cry on Monday. Do not go to the pharmacist and get my prescription, which I should have done because Monday night, we scheduled a DNC for Friday, of course. Monday night, wouldn't you know it, 7 p.m. rolls around. All of a sudden, the cramping is real. And let me tell you, I know that I've never experienced labor before. So if you have already had a baby, this is not your opportunity to say that I don't know what I'm talking about because I, I know that. However, I literally felt like I was having a contraction and then pushing out parts of a dead baby. And while I don't know real labor and I don't know those pains and I've never pushed a set of shoulders through my vagina, this is not that much better. I The cramps were very obviously specific. I would go through intense cramping where I could not talk through the pain and then a blood clot, an intense sleaze, a very big blood clot would come out. And this carried on for until from 7 p.m. until about 1.30 or 2 in the morning because I don't have my Vicodin, I'm taking a, probably an unhealthy amount of Advil. I mean, whatever the doctor allowed me. Um, but I, I've seen images of women who are in labor where they're like at the edge of a bed and someone's massaging their back or holding onto them from the front. And that is what I looked like. And it was miserable. To be honest with you, it was, it was a lot. It was a lot. So I am bleeding an amount that I did not know I could bleed before in a lot of pain. I finally am able to sleep at about two in the morning and I call the doctor's office the next day to say, hey, I think I've miscarried. We make an appointment for Wednesday to confirm this because now I don't trust my body at all that this is actually what happened. What if I'm wrong yet again? I am still bleeding. The cramping has ended. The cramping is mostly gone, but the bleeding has not stopped. Um, they're not concerned about the fact that the bleeding hasn't stopped because some people bleed for weeks after, after their miscarriage. Uh, the bleeding was so intense that I wasn't soaking more than a pad an hour, which was the point where I had to do something. But, and I was, we're talking heavy duty pads. We're talking that section of the aisle that is not cute and full of like pink t pads and tampons and all the fun Playtex stuff. We're talking heavy duty mofos. They are the wings overnight, whatever the maximum soakage of what is it that exists. Um, and because of how much I was bleeding and I had to, I did what's called like, I call it like H shape. So there was one across this way. So if my panty liner goes this way, normally I did one this way at the front, one this way at the back, and then a panty liner and then a pad in the middle just to cover all my bases with a pair of bike shorts on top just to keep everything together. Um, I used um, heating pad, uh, an electric heating pad, or like, you know, water heated, heated water bottles, um, heat, electric heating pads, and as much ibuprofen as I was allowed to, allowed to take and uh, drink a shit ton of water. We go into the ultrasound on Monday or Wednesday. Um, confirmed that I did in fact miscarry thank god uh they're not super concerned with my bleeding um but they said if I really want to I could I have a prescription for something that I can take that will stop the bleeding but the way that it stops the bleeding is that it intensifies cramping and this does not sound appealing to me so I figure I'll deal with the bleeding some more we go through the next few days I go back to work uh Saturday I feel not cramping. I feel pain, intense pain, but it feels like pressure uh, in a way that is really hard for me to describe, but it, it was, um, it felt like my uterus, I don't know, had like expanded beyond its normal size. It just felt so uncomfortable. I was in so much pain, but it wasn't cramping and I couldn't describe it. My doctor's office is closed on Saturdays. Um, and I am able to sleep through it, so I just go to bed and we'll see how I feel in the morning. I wake up in the morning Sunday and I feel fine, so I go to work. 
I go on about my day, everything's okay, and at about 11.30 or 12, the pain is back, and it is more intense than before. If I sit, I'm in pain. If I stand, I'm in pain. If I walk, I'm in pain. I uh, could not talk through the pain, which is the sign where something is really wrong. Um, and I'm still bleeding a lot. So I go to urgent care. Urgent care on the weekends does not have any kind of basically anything. They just have doctors. They don't have any of the machines or what do they call them? Imaging, whatever. The imaging department is not there. So urgent care quickly tells me to get on my way to, to the ER because they don't have the ability to help me. I go to the ER and my ER, good Lord, is the best ER I've ever been to. Within, I walk in the door, explain my situation. They have me immediately in a chair so fast that Ryan had dropped me off at the door and went to park the car where I could still see him. And be, before he's even walked into the, you know, through the doors, I'm already in a chair and they're just waiting for him to walk me and wheel me or wheel me to a room. They get me in a room. I'm immediately seen by a nurse and doctor. I mean, amazing. They had to do a vaginal or pelvic exam, whatever you want to call it. Because I'm at the ER, I'm on one of those flat beds. They don't have stirrups and the whole shebang to be able to do this. So they have to put me on what's like an elevated pillow. It's the most uncomfortable situation in my life. I am bleeding profusely, not into a pad, but just out into the world. Um, and it's a mess. I can tell it's a mess. I, I hate this feeling. Being a woman is the most undignified experience in the world. Um, and the doctor herself says, wow, there's a lot of bleeding, which is like the worst thing you could tell me right now, lady. Um, my pain is at a seven out of 10 at the time where they're doing all of this. I, they offer me pain meds um, and I say, well, I'm only at a seven out of 10. Maybe I'll just take some ibuprofen, which is stupid, Mariela. Why do you do this to yourself? So we do this pelvic exam. They're trying to figure out if this is an infection, which is my biggest fear. Um, if there's something still inside, which is also a huge fear. Um, I mean, sepsis is real, kids. So, they're doing all these tests and my pain starts elevating, partially because I'm probably so uncomfortable from all these tests, but also just because I'm in a ton of pain. So they finally give me pain meds and everything feels so much better. Why did I not get further pain meds before? I don't know. Great question. Um, they come back. My white blood cell count is very high. Um, but so it's something is wrong, but they don't there. I don't have any kind of vaginal infection, which is what they were afraid of. Um, and we go for the ultrasound and let me tell you ladies and gentlemen, maybe ultrasounds have never been pay painful for me. I have had them during intense bleeding before. I have had too many to count at this point. But this ultrasound was so painful that my own husband was like, maybe we should stop because he was there with me. I was crying. Um, one side, one ovary, my, when they went to the left side, everything was fine. I, I was okay. Um, she was checking around to see if there's any, um, you know, fetus left or whatever. And I felt fine. We go to the middle, feel some pressure, but I'm mostly okay. And then she went to the right side and I I can't even tell you what it felt like because I might have blacked out from the pain. It hurt so much. I figured it out though. I had, had and that was with me having pain meds. I'm crying because of the pain and I'm doped up on pain meds where to the point where I couldn't fully walk a straight line. So that is a lot. We get back from the ultrasound and we hang out for a little bit. I'm not with this camera. Why does it keep moving? Okay, so we get back from the ultrasound, waiting for someone to read the radiology results and tell me what's going on. The doctor comes in. The radiology results are inconclusive or confusing because they can't tell whether there's really something there or not. They're gonna call my regular doctor to compare them to what the ultrasound that he saw on Wednesday. 
my regular doctor says to them <laughs> in some way or another um, that there's no way that there's still something there. There was nothing there on Wednesday. He does not think that the problem is that there's still something there. He does not want them to do a DNC. He just wants them to give me some pain meds and some medication to stop the bleeding um, because I am definitely anemic at this point. Um, and he will see me the next day. So ultimately I went to the ER and got the pain meds that I should have had the whole time and the medicine to stop the bleeding that I also ha already had the prescription for. The pain medication can make you nauseous. So I have anti-anxiety or anti-nausea medicine, pain medication, um, medication for the cramping that is about to happen as a part of what I need to stop the bleeding and an antibiotic to try and figure out what the infection is uh, or try to try to cure whatever infection. Um, they tell me at the time that they think it's endometriosis, which it ends up being. Um, I take the pain medication, Vicodin, I conk out. I mean, that is the best sleep I will have had. I had basically since the two weeks prior and probably more because I wasn't sleeping well, well pregnant either. And the bleeding does eventually stop. I go back in the next day, the doctor says basically what I had already heard, which is I don't, he, does, he really truly did not believe that there was anything in there. He thought that I had endometri endometriitis, which is, endometriitis, which is where your uterus, ovaries, one of the two, both, all three, I don't know are inflamed and that is why I felt so much pressure um, and everything felt so sore when then I got the ultrasound. Um, the antibiotics are curing the endometriitis and essentially I am near the end of this whole thing. At this point, that is June 19th, I found out that I was going to have a miscarriage on June 4th. So it's two weeks. Of, of literal bullshit before things end. Things finally calm down. My HCG level on when I went to the hospital was 43. My HCG, HCG level two days later was 23. So it's definitely going down. My The highest I ever saw my HCG level was 1300 something, but I didn't test when I was, once it was like fully confirmed that I was pregnant. Um, and then um, and then I was just in my wait. Yeah, I had to wait 30 days from when I miscarried to be able to start over. And we weren't sure whether we were going to start again the first round immediately after or if we were going to take some more time. Just trying to heal emotionally and physically. I am so grateful that I was able to take time off work. And I was mostly not working throughout all of this. Because I can't even imagine dealing with some of this and being at work. Um, so those of you who do that, I hate my hats off to you. I don't even know how that happens. You are all rock stars to me. Um, but yeah, more or less, that was the end of my miscarriage experience. Um, things that I wish I'd done differently. I think I might have opted for the DNC and just I know that this sounds perverse, but just gotten it over with. I, perverse is maybe not the right word, but whatever. I just, waiting for it to happen is a horrible experience. And ultimately it didn't end right away either. So maybe I would have just dealt with the potential for scar tissue and had a DNC and, and known when it was over and, and been able to start the emotional healing process and physical healing process because I really did not get through that part until two weeks after I found out and that is a long time to feel like you're in limbo and um and I just felt so raw that entire time not that I maybe wouldn't feel differently if I'd had a DNC but I, I just have a feeling that that might have been a little easier um I would have taken my pain meds. I would have picked up my prescription when I was supposed to. Mariela, if you ever watch this back, can you please have learned your lesson on this? I am terrible at taking meds. I don't know why, especially pain meds. I have like this like fear. I don't know what's going on. So those are the things that I wish I'd learned. 
if you are going through this, please stock up on all of all of your favorite things. Eat all of the pasta if you are like me. Eat all of the cheese because fuck it. If you're gonna go through this, you might as well get to eat things that you like. Although dairy is bad for inflammation. Blah blah blah. Um, stock up on pads. <laughs> Um, I have friends who I've now watched who say that they buy pairs of like just cotton underwear to just be able to just dispose and get rid of so they don't have to deal with uh, the aftermath and that's probably a great idea. Um, order yourself a six pack of bike shorts, black bike shorts from Amazon or whoever your preferred retailer is. Got me through that situation. Um, or your favorite moo moo. Man, I love a house dress. So yeah. Those are the things that I wish I'd known. Outside of that, be gentle to yourself and know that it happens and know that there are millions of us who have experienced this and are here for you. That's it for today. Whew. All right. Bye. I bit my tongue when I said that. Bye.